All right, I believe we are now live. Um, I still don't know if I can see the number of people viewing, so I'll need your, your assistance, Kristen. But um, today is going to be about uh, hydration is the primary topic, but we can always open that up, up for anything else as well. Um, any other questions that are OSME related, but today I'm going to be talking most specifically about hydration, how to do it, why it's important, um, all the different things. So um, with that, we'll probably wait to get a couple people in here and then I'll dive in. So I probably should have put hydration on my little, um, little board over here, but that's okay. Um, hmm. Leading the charge. Oh, hey, Michael, you're at all of our meetings. Thanks for joining again. Um, so the first question, thanks for starting us off. Um, leading the charge, favorite electrolyte supplements to use? Um, you use Light Balance, L-Y-T-E. Um, for those with kidney concerns, there's Litho Light as well. You know, I'm actually not familiar with either of those, um, but I think that there's lots of different options out there. I made sure to grab a few. Uh, one of my go-tos for uh, for hydration is always coconut water. I just it I respond really well to it, and I mean this is just an example of one of them. I guess some of the downsides of using something like coconut water is there's a little bit more like natural occurring sugar, and you want to see if there make sure there's not too much added sugar. Um, but it does have a good amount of potassium, magnesium, and calcium naturally, and it just uh, it seems to work well. Uh, for me as kind of more of like my daily sipping electrolyte. But I also have um, a number of different other electrolyte supplements that I can recommend if you're somebody with an ostomy. It's uh, all of this should be prefaced with, um, you know, you should always talk to your clinician to make sure that you're taking the right types of supplements and the right amounts of them. If we're, we're talking about the importance of, of supplementation for hydration. Um, but a few of my go-to options that I always use is I, I like using occasionally um, what are called the ORS, ORSs, which is oral rehydration solutions. And that can be, there's a number of them, but they're, uh, they're called that because they're essentially medical grade, which just means they're going to be a higher concentration of different electrolytes. One of those examples would be liquid IV. So I've got that right here. Um, as one of the, one of the potential examples that, and this one's going to be relatively high in sodium content. So there's, there's 45 calories, um, which is referring to most of the, the carbohydrates. And we'll talk a little bit about the importance of carbohydrates, um, with electrolyte supplements later, but, uh, this particular one is going to have a really high concentration of sodium. And that's important because sodium is usually the, the one electrolyte that we need the most of in order for us to properly absorb the fluids that we're drinking into our muscles because we're going to be reliant on, um, on that salt to bind with the molecules of the water and that gets absorbed into the muscle membranes and is ultimately what hydrates you. Um, you know, a, a, this one actually has 500 milligrams of sodium in a single serving. And that's quite high. So I, one thing I like to make sure I mention when we're talking about an ORS that's going to have a really high concentration of sodium is that when you take something like this, you, you probably don't need more than one or two a day. And then the rest of your fluids can be like normal water um, just because that sodium is so high. And typically we're going to have a, a higher degree of sodium in our diet day to day. It's just kind of like most of the foods that we eat, especially if you're eating anything that's preserved, like, um, you know, if you use frozen meals or just like the, the more accessible foods, um, you know, that you're going to have a lot of sodium in our diets. It's just kind of the way things are with uh, the way that we eat in our society. So be cognizant that there are other electrolytes to keep in mind and, and balance out that equation. Um, and you can, you can talk with the clinician if you're somebody who's struggling with hydration and you want to find a good way of uh, balancing that, you can go and actually get tests run where they'll, they'll test your hydration and see uh, which one of, the, which of these electrolytes you might be um, lacking in or, or need more of. Because what I've actually found, and this is partially from trial and error over years of, of kind of digging through what I need is that sometimes I don't actually need as much sodium as the main electrolyte, 
but what I need is actually more magnesium and potassium based, which are a little bit less uh, likely to appear in our normal foods. And so like with those, there are other options. And again, you're going to have to be your own advocate in, in these cases. And uh, for ones, the one that I've been leaning towards recently as like my primary daily hydrator, that's uh, not coconut water. Um, Cause that's, again, that's usually my first choice, but it's kind of expensive and there's a little bit higher sugar content in this. So it's, I use it sparingly, but I do like it. Um, but the next one is called SOS. And so that one looks like this. Sorry, I've got my other, um, I would do that. Yeah. So SOS just looks like this. There's a bunch of different flavors, but the reason I'm bringing this one up as a counter to the liquid IV is this one is going to have a far lower concentration of sodium. And so I'm looking here for my sodium. This one only has uh, 300 grams per serving. So that's almost, it's about half the amount of sodium that you're finding in one serving here. But where it's an added addition is you're going to have 190 milligrams of potassium and 35 milligrams of magnesium. And, you know, all, most foods that we eat are going to have some degree of potassium and magnesium in them too. So, you know, you're not, you don't need to supplement 100% of your electrolytes just from these. But for those of us that have a higher requirement of uh, electrolytes as a whole, you want to make sure that you're balancing out those other ones because those are often the ones that... Um, don't appear as frequently in some of the common ones. So let me see, this one has, actually the, the liquid IV actually has a fair amount of potassium. It's the same amount that's in the SOS, um, but it does not appear to have any magnesium added to it at all. And so for me, I've, I've noticed a distinct difference in, you know, making sure that I'm supplementing with something that has magnesium in it, um, whereas this one doesn't have any of that. So again, it's something that you can, um, you can look through and talk, make sure to talk with your doctor. Cause you, you might be different than me. We, you know, we might, we might have different needs. I do run quite a lot and I sweat quite a lot. And so actually all of my needs for the amount of, uh, supplementation that I get throughout the day is going to be typically much higher. Um, so, but I, I'm drinking, you know, I probably end up having, uh, three to four servings of some version of either this or this throughout my day. Um, but that also includes usually an hour uh, minimum of like cardiovascular work where I'm going to be sweating and I need to replace that. Um, so with that in mind, that was a good starting point just to kind of dive into the topic of hydration and, you know, electrolytes are a big part of it. But um, transitioning away from, you know, what what our bodies needs from an electrolyte standpoint is also just the baseline amount of fluids that we need. And there are, um, actually, I've got a question here wondering if there are Canadian um, suppliers of liquid IV and SOS. I'm sure there are. Um, there's, you know, there's tons of different supplements out there. And like, you know, I'm not really particularly sold on any of them. Um, I have other ones here. Like this one is called um, Gainful, but this one actually has um, uh, added caffeine in it. So this is more of a performance one. And so, you know, on, when you're looking through the uh, ingredients lists of any of your hydration supplements, you should make sure to keep an eye on things like added caffeine, because a lot of times they'll sneak that in there because one, we like caffeine, it makes us feel good. And there's a little bit of an addictive quality there. Um, so it keeps you coming back. But usually if you're getting something with caffeine, it's going to be more performance based. You're going to be using it while you're exercising and it's like an immediate hit of both energy and some of that uh, immediate replacement of, of fluids, but you don't want to overload your system with caffeine. I think like 400 milligrams is kind of the, the top end of which somebody should have before it becomes unhealthy to consume more in a typical day. But that should be, you should be aiming to go well below that, excuse me, if you can manage. Um, and so you don't necessarily want to just supplement throughout your day with caffeine because caffeine can also be a diuretic. Uh, meaning that it can increase the rate in which you're going to the bathroom, both urination and, um, you know, number two. So whether you've got an ostomy or if you're just a normal person hydrating, um, caffeine is going to increase the rate at which uh, things move through our system. And so that, you know, depending on your situation, especially like kind of gearing this towards the ostomy population, um, it's probably wise to avoid caffeine for most, most circumstances if you're just looking for like baseline hydration. Um, 
So yeah, but like to the question about where these are available, I think like any major big box store like Targets, Walmarts or their equivalents are going to have some versions of these like electrolytes. I know Liquid IV and SOS, the first two that I, were, I was talking about that I use, um, these are pretty big companies. They're, they're I, as far as I know, global. So you should be able to find these pretty easily. Um, so again, that's Liquid IV and SOS. Those are my, my top two, at least personal preference. Um, but then there's, uh, you know, we talked about one that has added caffeine. So something to, to look out for when you are picking supplements to try to avoid that unless you're specifically looking for it. Um, but there are other ways of getting hydrated as well. So um, there are, are other options like this one is, is a performance-based brand. It's, it's Martin. Um, this one's really popular amongst endurance athletes because like this one's, this is actually a gel, uh, but they do make servings of like hydration supplements to add to water. But what to keep in mind with something like this is it's, um, it's more similar to something like a Gatorade, uh, where the, the sugar content is intentionally really high. And I think, I think Gatorade kind of gets a bad rap sometimes in that, you know, it does have a lot of sugar and, you know, it's pretty much just a sodium based electrolyte. There's, you're not going to have many like of those magnesium or potassium additives, but what people need to understand about something like Martin, which is, you know, performance that's on the same line as Gatorade is that sugar is situationally a very good thing to have. And so if you're being active, like in the moment of activity, say you're on a run or a bike ride, it's actually a good thing to get carbohydrates along with your electrolytes as well, because that's going to replenish your glycogen stores, which is just a fancy word for uh, the carbohydrates that you're storing to burn as quick energy. Um, it's going to be more accessible than burning fat. Everyone likes to think that, you know, when you go out for a really long run or really long bike ride that you might want to deplete yourself of carbohydrates so that you burn fat. But in reality, that's not actually how fat burning metabolizes. Like, I mean, to an extent it does, but when you think about if your goal is losing weight, um, most of the weight that's coming off and it's actually burning from your body uh, comes later after you're done exercising because your baseline um, rate at which you're burning calories, your metabolism is increased. And you actually, believe it or not, I, I love this fact, you breathe out most of most of the weight. So when, you, when you're burning calories, burning fat, um, if you're looking to lose weight, that actually doesn't usually happen in the moment of the activity and you're you're kind of doing yourself a disservice by going into glycogen debt in in most cases so um, again there are situations where something like a martin or a gatorade or something that's really high in sugar content can work for you if you're actually exercising while you take it but just keep that in mind as something where if you're not in the middle of the activity you should really be looking again more towards these types of options where you're going to have a significantly reduced amount of uh, sugars or carbohydrates because sugar is really just another word for carbohydrate. Um, so this is a more sustainable like kind of daily option if you're not actively exercising. Um, so that's good to know as well. Now, um, one thing I want to make sure that I talk about because I, I know I'm kind of jumping from topic to topic here, but um, you know, a lot of the problem that many of us face is, uh, in addition to the electrolyte supplementation is just the, like the baseline volume of water that we're getting throughout the day. And that most of us are actually falling short of what that daily requirement is. And, you know, I, I, what I would say is that, you know, it's incredibly important to, to find out what that, um, that baseline amount of fluid that you should drink is. And uh, like, I would just recommend that it's just uh, like type in hydration calculator into Google. And, you know, like the, there will be many results where you can just basically put in your like uh, your height. So right there, I'm doing it right now. So I'm putting in my height, putting in my, my weight and my age. And that will give me, um, it'll also, you can, it, this one actually even has in the moment where it's, I'm, I'm using Camelback's website, but it can tell you like, it'll ask like, what color is your urine? Um, so I'll, I'll drop this one in the chat for anybody who wants to, to take a look at this um, along with me. Uh, but uh, that, that'll kind of tell you a guide of like, what do you need? Um, yeah, how much do you sweat? And what are the activities that you're doing? Um, but let's just say for me, the, the, the hydration amount that I should be drinking, um, it's telling me is about 1.7 liters per hour during exercise. And you can, 
uh, recalculate that to get like your daily average for for an entire day. Um, but you know, I think almost everybody who does this for the first time will realize like, wow, I'm actually not drinking nearly as much water as I should be I should be consuming based on just the daily recommended value. Um, so that's that's a big step one is if you're not getting the total volume of water, that has to be the first thing you check off. Number two is making sure that you've got the right balance and uh, amount of electrolytes in order to absorb that water properly. And, but third, and I think that this one is also a really important one that you know everyone knows about electrolytes. And I think most people understand that there's a, a baseline amount of water we should be taking in in a day. But the third thing is to be really cognizant and aware of uh, how you're consuming the water or your fluids throughout the day. And that's really important because, um, you know, if, if you let's say you're supposed to drink four liters of water per day and that's what your calculation is giving you, um, that that can really the, the way in which your body absorbs that water is not going to be totally efficient if you were just to drink it all at one time. So if I just had a four liter jug of water, I, I couldn't wake up in the morning and just slam four liters of water and expect that to get high, to hydrate my me in the same way as if I were to spread it out over the course of the day. And, you know, I, I love to use this, this analogy that I heard. I don't remember where I heard it, but um, the, it was the analogy of, of like charging a battery. And so if you've got like your, your phone and it's at a very low battery percentage uh, and you plug it in a lot of times within 10 or 15 minutes of that charge, the battery is, fills up disproportionately high. Like you can get 50% of your battery really quickly. But as you approach closer and closer to 100% full battery, uh, that that time that it takes for you for it to recharge is going to extend. You know, so a lot of times now, if you have a, an iPhone, when you plug it in, it says estimated time for completion of charging, and it's many hours into the future. Um, our bodies actually work in a very similar way, and so that like if you're if you're chronically dehydrated where it's like you're really having trouble, your body's going to cling to everything that you put into it. And, you know, if electrolytes, water, it's, it's desperate. But where a lot of people fall short is not so much that, that um, acute, difficult hydration stage, but rather where the hydration becomes you're like 80 to 90% of the way there. And it's that last 10, 20% of hydration um, that can still make a big difference. And, you know, that's, when we talk about having chronic dehydration issues where it's, it might not be noticeable for the majority of your day. Like you might not notice it. Um, but the, uh, if, if you're able to like, if you're able to get to that 80 or 90% bridging that final gap is going to require, uh, consistency over time throughout the day. So you need to be taking small sips, as frequently as you can. So it's like, if you have your four liters per day, um, then you should spread it out over the entire time that you're awake as evenly as, as, as is reasonable. And so a good way that I've learned to do that is to usually I, I have a water bottle with me at all times. If I've left the house, I've got my, my water bottle that's near the door and it's just, it's part, it's attached at the hip essentially. And it's just something like, I usually put a bunch of stickers on mine and make it fun just so it's like, it's, uh, something that I'm always carrying around, but it, like just having that there as um, a constant reminder and you make it part of your habit to to just casually and consistently sip water throughout the day. Um, it'll help you reach that baseline amount that you need, but also uh, it will um, spreading it out that way will make it so that you're able to absorb that water as effectively so that that battery analogy can be translated over to like our human battery. So we're recharging by putting water in there and that gives us the energy and the ability to do everything that we need to do because water is crucially important to the, our day to day. Um, and, you know, so if you're kind of wondering if you're chronically mild de mildly dehydrated, um, the answer is, uh, you know, I, I think there's a few things to consider. One thing that I've, I've been taught and have learned to do over my course as an athlete that has translated really well into uh, now having an ostomy and having to be even more uh, particular about the amount and frequency I'm taking in is I sh I've kind of trained myself to never actually feel the sensation of thirst. And so if you, if you feel really thirsty, like, oh my gosh, I just need to chug some water right now. That means that you've probably not done a great job of hydrating to stay ahead of that because your, your body's thirst response is also it's not a perfect system you know that's kind of a 
like a default alarm bell that we get where you're actually feeling thirsty. Um, but you know, a lot of times we, if we're doing it correctly, you shouldn't ever get to the point where you have that, that really deep need to like drink a bunch of water, because once that's happened, that's a trigger that you've already become dehydrated. And so a, a good kind of key to, to guide, am I drinking enough water throughout the day? Is it frequently enough? Um, would be to try to make it so you go through a day without actually feeling that sensation of thirst come up where you where you're just staying one step ahead of that. Um, so that can be one one good cue. Um, but you know some of the common signs of mild dehydration or, or really any level of dehydration would just be if you get regular headaches, um, if you uh, stand up quickly, if you, um, you you can get low blood pressure from from having uh, like being dehydrated. So if you stand up quickly and then you kind of get that blackness where it's like you can't see it first or maybe you're a little dizzy, um, those are definitely signs of potential dehydration. Um, nausea and abdominal cramping, it can give you kind of a, an upset stomach feeling if you let it go too long. Um, and you know that a lot of times, sometimes that nausea can kind of work against us where, you know, if we allow ourselves to become dehydrated to the point where it's making us feel nauseous, that nausea can be kind of a deterrent for wanting to drink more water. But most times nausea, you, you're, it's still, it's a sign like, Hey, I need to, I need to put fluids in there. And so, you know, sometimes our, the cues that our bodies give us are not always perfect. And so it's about learning, you know, exactly how much water do I need to drink each day? And have I, have I checked off enough at this point in the day? to where this nausea can be explained by something else? Or am I behind where I should be in this point in the day with how much water I need to drink in, in my total waking hours? Um, Cause that's, that's another good thing. But, you know, um, some more symptoms of dehydration can also include things like dry skin, if that's a constant issue um, and muscle cramping, that's a big one, especially for those of us that uh, are athletic and do like rigorous sports or maybe our job, is fairly demanding and causes a lot of sweat. If you, if you're getting consistent muscle cramps, um, that's likely a dehydration issue. And, uh, I think more specifically with muscle cramps, that one's probably related to the electrolyte input as well. Cause, um, the sodium in particular, if you've depleted your system of sodium, the cramping is usually the first or at least the most, uh, poignant <laughs> element that happens there. Um, and then also your heart rate. Um, you know, that not everybody keeps track of their heart rate, uh, throughout the day. And, but if you do, or if you've got a watch that kind of tells you that you can look like in your health settings, if your watch does track your, your heart rate and see like, what is my baseline resting and at movement heart rate zones, um, over the course of many months. And then like on a single day, if your heart rate is really increased, you know, that could be also a sign that your, your hydration is, is not where it needs to be. And it should be a focus of yours. Um, so, all right, let me see. I, I know I've been rattling off a bunch of stuff. I've got a lot of stuff to say about hydration, but let me see if there's any questions here for anybody. Um, drip, drip drop. So, uh, that's another good option. Thanks for that as well. Um, drip drop is, is similar to SOS and, uh, liquid IV. These are the oral rehydration solutions. That's another option. Um, and then there's another one called, H2 ORS, which is another medical grade hydration supplement, very similar to liquid IV. I think that one's a bit higher on the sodium content as well. Um, but let's see, Michael, you said that you always figured that if, if one of the colon's primary jobs is to recycle water and I don't have one, I, then I need to sip smaller amounts more frequently to disperse the water throughout the body. Um, so no, so the thinking the large intestine is like a sponge. Um, that's actually, it's close. You're, you're close. And this is, you know, my understanding. I'm not, a, I don't have any letters behind my name, so I'm not a doctor, but I have done quite a bit of, of learning about this. And my understanding of the large intestines purpose, uh, for specifically hydration is that it, it does act as a sponge, but not so much for the fluids that you drink in. There's actually a portion of your small intestine called the duodenum, um, or the, let's see, the duodenum or boy, I usually, the jejunum. So that's duodenum or jejunum. It's one of those two that is in the small intestines that's more, most specifically for the absorption of the majority of our electrolytes and the actual like fluid water that we're drinking. However, this is an important caveat is that 
uh, with the large intestine, one of its primary functions is other than just being a reservoir for, you know, the food that we eat before it comes out as poop. Um, it's to absorb the remaining water that's in the fibrous types of foods that we eat. So most specifically, that's referring to things like uh, fruits and vegetables, which have a really high water content and they, you know, there's fiber there, but because of the structure of those, those plants, usually, um, as you're chewing it up, you're not going to get that, that water out of that, uh, as, by the time it makes it to your lo large intestine, your colon. And so the colon where it's actually, where you're getting some of the water is coming from the food that you're eating. And, you know, there's a, like rough, roughly thinking, um, you know, I think like, I've heard, I've, I've read and heard that somewhere between 20 and 30% of our absorption of water happens in the large intestine from the foods that we eat. So it, that might be higher for those of us who eat a higher percentage of fruits and vegetables and lower for those of us who don't. But there's some degree of that that's happening from the food that is dependent on the large intestine. So as far as your, your thinking goes, Michael, about um, how to like sip smaller and more frequently, I think that that's good advice just as a baseline. Like, yes, we should all sip small and frequently throughout the day. Um, but I think also understanding that, you know, the function of the large intestine is more for the amount of water that we're getting from the foods that we eat. And the, like the underlying thing here is that if we're getting, let's say 20% less of the water that we normally get from the food, that our daily recommended amount of water might do well to dial that up by 20%. So if, again, if I'm, if I'm looking at four liters of water, um, that might be 4.8 liters of water. That's 20% in, increase of the amount of, of fluids um, that you'd want to consume throughout the day. Because again, we have a, if you have no colon at all, you're going to be at a distinct deficit because we're, we're just, we're not digesting food that way anymore. So um, that's, that's how I've, uh, my understanding of it, I could be wrong. So if there's a clinician out there that needs to set me right, please do it. Um, but that's, you know, everything that I've learned and have, have been told about this process is that's, that's kind of the, the gist of it. So next question here from Kathy, is there any way that I can get over the fact that potassium in the electrolyte drinks make me sick to my stomach? That's a good question because potassium and magnesium can both be um, a little bit harder to digest and absorb. Um, so for those cases, what I would consider, if it is something that you're having trouble with, with those drinks, um, you can get chewable gummies. Um, so like I've got an example of that. This is a D3 complex with vitamin D and a couple other things in there, but um, you can find gummies that are electrolyte gummies that are all different levels of like potassium, magnesium. Um, and so yes, and hopefully you know, if you, if you're getting your potassium and magnesium through something like this, it might be a little bit easier on your system to absorb it so that you're, you know, the, the volume of liquid that you're taking in is, is going to be, uh, just regular water or something that's not upsetting you, your stomach. And then you just kind of get that more concentrated dose of those electrolytes that you'd be missing, uh, at a separate time. So I, that's my recommendation to try for, you know, avoiding, like if, if these normal supplements kind of bother your stomach, um, you can try the, the gummy version of the electrolytes. And that's a helpful thing to, to work on. Um, let's see. Um, I know that there were a few other questions I had lined up, so let's find them. So here's some good questions that we can talk about in regards to hydration. Um, what do the dehydration symptoms look for? Oh, I've kind of covered a lot of these. Do I... So, oh, a good question is about artificial sweeteners. So that's a, um, that's a question I get a lot and that I've, I've done research on, and I'm, I'm going to say it's, I'm, I'm fairly unconvinced either way. Um, so you'll notice like I, I've been kind of promoting the liquid IV and SOS as my favorite, but both of these have some degree of, um, the SOS has, what do we got? It's, there is some actual sugar in here, but there's stevia extract. And some people hear the word stevia and they're like, nope, that's not for me. Uh, it's an artificial sweetener. It's no good. But um, from everything that I've read, and I have a particular interest in 
hydration, but also just dietary stuff in general. Um, it's just, it's, I think it's fascinating. Um, and one of the reasons it's really interesting to learn is that nutritional studies are very difficult to replicate. Um, so most nutritional studies that are out there uh, are do not have follow-up studies that can confirm or deny their, uh, their reliability. And that goes uh, for the case of um, ingesting regular amounts of artificial sweeteners. And so the, the results there are really inconclusive about, is it bad for you or is it good for you? Though I think the takeaway is that everything that I've seen shows that the amount of, um, as long as you're not taking in large quantities of artificial sweeteners each day, that a little bit like one or two servings per day, maybe even three or four like moderate servings of something like this, where it's really not actually that much in here, um, are, are not going to have any like dis distinctly negative effects. There have been some studies that show that uh, artificial sweeteners may be more of a diuretic than a natural sugar. Um, so meaning, again, it's going to flush through your system a little bit faster, um, maybe like loosen up the output if you if you are going to the bathroom. Um, but uh, I think for the most part, as long as you're not overdoing it um, and then like, keeping it in moderate amounts that you, you should be able to use artificial sweeteners um, in your electro electrolytes supplements throughout the day. And it, it shouldn't cause too much of a problem. Just uh, I, I'm a big proponent of, you know, for every, like every serving of electrolyte based fluids that you're drinking, you're having you know, one equivalent size amount of fluids where it's just water. Um, and, you know, if you do that, I can't imagine having more than like three or four uh, at most uh, servings of something with artificial sweeteners. And so if you're looking for my opinion on artificial sweeteners is in moderation, they're fine. And whatever is going to taste good and allow you to drink the amount of water that you need throughout the day. Because I, I know one of the big problems with getting the volume of flu fluids that we need is that uh, it just, it's hard to, to do that. We, it's a lot of drinking and having a, something that tastes a little bit better, makes it a bit more enticing. Um, and that can just help us reach the, the goal of, of staying better hydrated. So, you know, for those of you that are kind of on the fence about them, I wouldn't shy away from them necessarily. You can always ask your doctor, they have their own opinions about it and you can do the research as well. Um, I would recommend checking out Stealth Belt's website. Uh, all of this stuff that I'm talking about, I've described in both written and in a video format in like more of a, a shortened one. So if you go to stealthbelt.com and go to our community section with our resources, um, there will be a lot of this information and my sourcing for where I got it. Like what are the studies that I've looked at uh, to kind of back up what I'm talking about? Um, so you can uh, you can put me to the test and make sure I'm not I'm not full of it. But, you know, I, I think now after running many marathons and many thousands of miles with the ostomy, I'm, I'm pretty sure I, I, at least for me, I've dialed it in. But all right, I've got a question over here from Kinsey. How do I manage increased output that comes with consuming such large amounts of liquid to stay hydrated? Good question, Kinsey. Thank you. Um, so one, the way that I approach that is because you're absolutely right, especially since I have an ileostomy where the output is usually more on the water, watery side compared to a colostomy where it's going to be a really thick output, um, much less of a problem for most people with colostomies. Uh, but the the main answer to that is I, I selectively use foods throughout my day that I know are going to be really absorptive and that have low water contents to begin with, but ultimately just slow everything down as I'm eating it. My number one recommendation there is actually bananas. Um, I really like bananas. I usually eat, I try to eat one a day if I can, but what bananas do for me is they slow down my track. They add both the potassium, which we all know bananas are known for high, being high in potassium. Um, but also they've got a good amount of magnesium, I believe. Um, and they slow everything down. And so when I'm, when I'm consuming lots of water, I make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm also eating foods that are going to, uh, consistently, or to give me a more consistent like ver like uh, ability to predict how my output's going to be. I've also heard that there are are things like some people will eat like a couple marshmallows each day. Um, that's not not really my style. I, I think it's just like a necessary type of like art like sugar. And just generally, I try not to eat um, refined sugars like that. Not that it has anything negative or positive. I just the amount of calories. I'm just trying to make sure that I, I pick and choose my battles. 
Um, but, um, you know, for people who are really struggling with watery output, I think that marshmallows and bananas and maybe like uh, a white rice are, are good. Like you don't need a lot of any of those things. Like when I'm talking white rice, it might just be like you have less than a, a cup of cooked rice in the day. And that's enough to kind of slow down the digestive tract so that your output isn't happening so fast that you're just like, you can't even keep putting water in as quickly. Cause I, there have been days for me as well, that it's uh, very difficult to stay on, uh, on track with that. Um, all right. So let me just checking through to make sure I didn't miss any questions from anybody. Um, these have been good questions so far, guys. Thank you. Canned pumpkin slows the, the output down even more than bananas. That's an interesting one. I've never, I've never eaten canned pumpkins, but I, I feed it to my dog. Actually, he loves pumpkin. So maybe I'll have to give it a taste next time he's got, he's got pumpkin on the menu for his lunch. Um, all right. So I'm trying to think if there's anything else I'd like to make sure I cover in regards to hydration. We covered some of the supplementation questions. Um, we have talked about different types of foods that help slow it down. We've talked about what are the signs of dehydration. Um, oh, that's, that's another point that I like to talk about, the signs of dehydration. So we've, we've kind of talked about, you know, some of the, the different uh, things to look, look for, like headaches, muscle aches, uh, cramps, those types of things. But one thing that uh, is often out there that uh, is it's not misinformation, there's definitely truth to using this as a barometer, but it's often misinterpreted or you, you can be led astray if this is your only marker, but looking at the color of your pee. And so when we're looking for hydrated pee, like what, what does that color look like? It's going to be kind of an off yellow. So you don't want it to be totally clear. Because what's happened if you're if you're peeing and your your urine is totally clear, that means that you've you're probably flushing your system and you're not actually absorbing the water with your kidneys. It's actually just kind of coming out and you're not you're not getting the benefit of that. And to an extent, you could even uh, dehydrate yourself that way if you if you were peeing too much and it's all clear liquid. Um, so the color you're looking for is kind of an off yellow, like a lighter colored yellow. Um, but, you know, keep that in mind that, again, our bodies are not a perfect system. So like the like we, we also have to keep in mind, like if you take B vitamin supplements, which is um, something that's really common as something that helps with iron absorption, uh, anemia and their B vitamins are. I, I recommend that as one of the few supplements that I actually take throughout the day that's specific to something that are just general health and well-being. I'm a big fan of, of B vitamin supplementation. But um, if you're if you take something like that, it's going to change the color of your urine. And that can if that's your only cue for am I dehydrated or not, you want to make sure uh, that that is uh, going to be um, factored into your equation, so to speak. Um, but also, again, like the if, if you ever get to the point where you see really dark urine where it's dark yellow or even brown in some cases. Um, that's that, that's more of a good indicator that, hey, I'm really dehydrated. And not om only am I at a deficit of water, but also the electrolyte uh, concentration in my body is needs to be adjusted. So, so long as you're, the color of the urine is not being influenced by the supplements that you're taking. And if it's really a darker color or something that jumps out to you or, or is more pungent of a smell. Uh, those are things to, to make sure to like raise the alarm bells. Cause I've, you've fallen behind if your urine has gotten to that point. Um, and you know, you don't want to stay there for very long cause it can cause like kidney damage and other things if it, if left unaddressed. So that's always something to keep in mind as well. Okay. What else can we talk about? I guess another fun fact is that uh, calcium is actually technically, no, not technically, it is a um, uh, kind of the the ugly stepchild of the electrolytes, but no one talks about calcium because we, we typically get more than enough calcium in, in a normal diet. So as long as you're getting your normal amount of food where you're not actively losing weight, um, then you shouldn't need to supplement calcium for hydration purposes. But those of us that may have like bone density issues or other things like, um, uh, particularly like 
those with like arthritic symptoms as well might do well to supplement with, uh, with calcium. Cause that, that can also be, it's a, it's helpful in the process of binding those water molecules to the, the actual body. Excuse me. Um, let's see. Um, another one, actually, if we, if we go back briefly here, just before we wrap up, cause I'm kind of running out of stuff, but I, you know, it's been a pretty good one, 40 minutes rattling, rattling stuff off about hydrations, probably more than anyone needs. But, um, if you're looking for other options of different hydration supplements, one of my favorites for when I feel that I've really fallen behind is actually Pedialyte, which, you know, is, I, I think most notably known for like little kids that are sick. But I think that it, it works really well um, for hydration in general. It's very like specific for that purpose. It doesn't always taste great, but you know I, I find that with all of these supplements, like the better that they taste to me, the more my body probably needs them. Whereas if I'm I take a sip of something and I'm like, oh that kind of that's leaving a weird taste in my mouth. That's kind of my body telling me like, hey, you you don't really need the electrolytes right now, so maybe switch over to regular water. Um, but Pedialyte is a, a really good option. You find those at any like pharmacy, like, uh, they'll, they'll have a section of Pedialyte options. And I'm a big fan of, of Pedialyte for the rehydration when like after, uh, you know, particularly after big events where, you know, if I've just run a marathon or maybe I was out having a little bit too much fun the night before and I needed to, to get things back. Like I know Pedialyte's been used for that kind of thing in the past. And I would I'd say that it's oftentimes a really good option if you're looking to kind of get back on top of a deficit that's formed in the amount of, uh, the amount of fluids that you're getting. Um, and then there are other, uh, zero calorie options by, uh, there's two companies that I really like that make the little like fizz tabs that you can drop into your water. And that would be like noon. So N U U N and goo G U. And these are both again, um, uh, supplements that are meant to be zero calorie, and they are going to have some small amount of uh, artificial flavoring and sweeteners, but usually less so than other ones. And they're usually dominant on sodium. So they're, again, uh, you want to dial in what, what are your needs. And if you're really trying to be curious about this, go get your blood work done and talk to your doctor about like, hey, what can I do to, to balance my electrolytes more effectively? Like, what do I, what is my normal diet getting me at the end of the day uh, sort of thing? They can help you I dial that in and you, you know, part of this is trial and error and it's a conversation that we have with our bodies. And, you know, the, I, I do believe that over time you begin to develop more of an intuitive sense of what you need at different times throughout the day. And I think, you know, all of this has to start with a recognition of, I have a baseline level or in need, and this is when I meet it, this is how I should feel and, you know, keeping track of those days that are good. And then, you know, keeping track of the days where it's not so good and comparing like, what did I, what did I do differently on these two days? Like maybe I exercised a little bit more on the day that was not so good. And so I, I should probably increase the volume of liquid and the electrolytes that are found in those, that volume of fluids on those days where I'm going to be outside and it's hot or I'm exercising. Um, but, you know, again, just being aware of, of these are, is the, the biggest step because I think by and large, most of us, the biggest challenge is just to build the routine, build the habit that will keep us hydrated throughout the day. So um, with that, uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and bring this to an end because uh, I am kind of running out of things to talk about that are that I that, that I feel qualified to talk about, I guess I should say. So um, thanks to everybody who joined in and that will be watching this in the future. I hope you found it helpful. Um, again, check out stealthbelt.com, our website. There, all of this information is more succinctly written and put together in video formats there under our community section. Um, and you can see the references of some of the places that I got this information if you want to do some of your own deeper dives into this. Um, but thanks again, and I hope you all have a great rest of your Thursday.